Welcome to part two of chapter 25. Today we're going to continue our talk on transition metals and coordination compounds, and we're going to cover three different topics. The first of which is applications of these coordination compounds. Where would you see them, you know, in real life? And then we're going to learn how to name coordination compounds and how to write the formula from the name. And then finally, we're going to look a little bit at valence bond theory, which was our theory of bonding that we used back in chapter 10 in Chem 1 when we talked about bonding in covalent molecules. Uh, so we'll look at how that applies to coordination compounds. And then our next lecture, we'll be talking about crystal field theory, which is a better way of looking at bonding in these coordination compounds. So lots to cover today. Let's get going. All right. So first off, applications of coordination compounds. So one of the ways that we use it is that we can extract metals from their ores as coordination compounds, which is really cool. Like you don't come across, you know, a pile of silver or a pile of gold out, you know, in, in the wilderness, right? Um, but these silver and gold are, are as ores and you can actually react them with cyanide to make these uh, coordination compounds, right? And complex ions that we can use to dissolve these metals and extract them, which is really cool. We can extract nickel as this gaseous compound, right? This nickel carbonyl compound. Um, and so we can get that one out that way. Really neat. Uh, we can also use these coordination compounds or complex ions as chelating agents for heavy metal poisoning. I mentioned this last time, right? When we were looking at EDTA, um, EDTA is used if you suspect that someone has lead poisoning right? Um, they will essentially kind of drink this calcium uh, EDTA complex. And then what happens is the lead will kick the calcium out of the middle and the lead will be bonded to the EDTA, right? Coordinated to the EDTA. And then you essentially, you know, poop it out or pee it out, right? You, you excrete it as this EDTA complex ion, and it leaves behind calcium in your body, which is totally fine, right? We always wanna have calcium, that's why we drink milk and those kinds of things. Uh, so that's really neat. Uh, the reason that the lead will kick that you know, calcium out is that the lead complex ion is more stable than that calcium complex ion. So the lead will replace the calcium. Really, really neat. Uh, we also use it for qualitative analysis. So when we get to qualitative analysis in this class, we will use these um, complex ions to you know, give a positive test for certain metals. Um, one of them that we do is that when we're testing for iron, we will make this iron thiocyanate complex ion and it turns red and that red color is gonna be like, yes, I have iron, which is awesome. You can also use it to positively test for cobalt um, and it will, that same, um, that same anion, right, that thiocyanate, will turn blue in the presence of cobalt, and it will turn red in the presence of iron, which is really neat. Um, you can do the same thing with this compound called DMG. Um, you can test it for, you know, nickel or lead, and it will turn this really beautiful red, we call it the cherry red precipitate, in the presence of nickel, um, but if it was in the presence of lead, it would turn yellow, which is really cool. Um, so we use it for qualitative analysis, and then we also use uh, these complex ions for commercial color coloring agents like um, inks and blueprints and cosmetics, right? Paints, all kinds of things. So you see these coordination compounds, these complex ions um, more often than you might think. So you actually have a lot of these, um, you know, coordination compounds or complex ions floating around in you, which is really neat. And so we have transition metals um, in us. We need these transition metals. Like you know that you need iron, you know that you need zinc in order to allow your body to function. Um, so as you can see here, we have a bunch of different elements, these transition elements, and these aren't all of them. This is just kind of a, a short list of, of elements that exist in your body and they have um, purposes, right? They help your body maintain its function, right? Like we need iron for, you know, hemoglobin. We need iron for oxygen transport. It's really, really important. You have to have iron or your, you know, your body won't function. You won't be able to get the oxygen that you need. Um, so really neat. We're going to talk a little bit more about that one, right? With hemoglobin. Um, so hemoglobin consists of four different protein chains and each one of those have a bound heme. Okay. And an iron complex that is, um, sorry, a heme is this iron complex. Um, and it's typically connected to a protein. Okay, we have this iron ion and it's coordinated to a polydentate ligand called a porphyrin. 
Okay, and so this is what the heme looks like over here. So we have the iron in the middle, and then that thing around the outside, that complex or that um, that thing that's coordinated to it, right? Um, that is a polydentate ligand called a porphyrin. And so it's got um, four different nitrogens that can coordinate to this metal ion, right? Um, and this isn't the only kind of porphyrin. The porphyrin is when it has these four nitrogens and kind of a planar structure like this. Um, but this one is, is bond to the iron. And if we get four of these together, then we can make up this hemoglobin which is cool. So you can see the four here, um, two of them are in orange and then two of them are in blue so that you can see the difference there. Um, but again, in order to make this structure, we need to have iron and it has to be coordinated to a porphyrin and then we need four of them together, right? So complex ions and coordination compounds, really important, uh, not just in this class, but actually out in the real world, right? Another one that you might have heard of, right, likely, is chlorophyll. Um, and it's another porphyrin-based biomolecule, but instead, now we have magnesium, um, and this is a different porphyrin. And, but, you know, we all know that chlorophyll is really important for photosynthesis, right? We convert our light energy from the sun into that chemical energy so that plants can grow. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the formulas of coordination compounds. Um, so coordination compounds can, can consist of three different, um, or there's three different types essentially of coordination compounds, the way that they can show up. One of them is that we will have a complex ion as our cation, and then we will have some anions as our counter ions. And these would be simple things like chlorides or bromides or things like that. Um, we could also have the complex ion as the anion, right? And then we can have it coordinated to simple cations like sodium or potassium, something like that. Or you can have two complex ions that end up bonded together, right? We could have our complex ion as a cation and a complex ion as our anion, and they can end up bonded. So three different ways that can show up, and we're going to look at some of those. So when we are writing the formula of a coordination compound, um, the cation is written before the anion. This is just like normal anytime we're writing bonding stuff, right? We always need to write the cation before the anion. The charge of the cation is going to be balanced by the charge of the anion. Again, same. We should all be nodding along. This is good so far. Um, the metal ion is going to be written first, and so this is for the complex ion, okay? Um, the metal ion is going to be written first in the complex ion, then we're going to write neutral ligands and then anionic ligands, okay? And then we'll stick the whole thing in brackets um, and we'll put the charge on the outside of that brackets if we need it. Um, if you happen to have multiple neutral ligands or multiple anionic ligands, then we're going to write them in alphabetical order. So let's go ahead and look at this. So this would be um, how you know a, a coordination compound would look, right? In this one, we have our complex ion is our anion, so we have a simple cation here, okay? Um, when we're going to write either the charge, or sorry, when we're going to write either the formula of the complex ion or of the coordination compound, or we're gonna write the name of it, either way, we need to know the charge on the metal ion. So I wanna talk through that before we get any farther into writing formulas and, and talking about names, okay? So if we are looking at this coordination compound, we need to figure out the charge on the cobalt. So that's what we're doing right now, okay? Um, if we look at the charge of the coordination compound, it's neutral, right? Our cations are always gonna be balanced um, by our anions. So now we're going to look um, at the complex ion. So we have two potassiums that are balancing out the charge of our complex ions. We know potassium has a one plus charge. There's two of them there, so we have a total two plus charge. Um, that is balancing the charge of our complex ion. So we know that our complex ion must have a two minus charge because it's being balanced out by those two potassiums. Okay, so now if we look at the charges of everything that's in the brackets and we add them all up, that will give us our two minus. So ammonia, right, this NH3, that's neutral. So that's not impacting our charge at all. So the only thing impacting our charge really is this cobalt and the chlorides. Okay, so we have four chlorides, which are all gonna be negatively charged, and then we have that one cobalt. So if we have four negative chlorines and our overall charge is two minus, that means our cobalt has to be a two plus to you know, get us to this two minus here with those four chlorides. 
Um, but I like to make it into a math problem because I feel like um, math makes everything easier. If you don't like math, you don't have to make it into a math problem. You can reason it out like I just did. Um, but here's like a little formula for you. So the charge of our complex ion is going to equal the charge of our metal plus the total charge of our ligand. So the charge of our complex ion. So that's our two minus here. So that's, that's what's there. And then we're going to add up the charges of everything in the brackets. So cobalt, I just wrote cobalt because we don't know what it is. Um, and then we have two ammonias, right? And each one has a zero charge. Ammonia is not a charged species. Um, so I put two times zero for the two ammonias. And then we have four chlorides, right? And they're each a minus one. Um, and we know that because chloride is a halogen, right? Um, and so I put that there. So, and then I simplified everything. So we get negative two equals cobalt minus four from those four chlorides. Um, this went away. And then if we add four to both sides, that gets us that cobalt is equal to plus two, right? So we have CO2 plus. And that's how I would look, look at it. I kind of do that in my head, even when I'm reasoning it out. Um, but that is how I would think through it, especially if you're having a hard time with this. Okay. Um, so we can also do this same kind of process if the, um, right, this last one we had our, our metal was in the, the anion, sorry. We can also do the same thing if our metal is in the cation now, right? And it's being balanced by a simple anion. We do the exact same thing. So chloride, right, we just have one of them and it's a one minus charge, which means that our complex ion must have a one plus charge because it's being balanced out by the chloride. So then again, we're gonna go through this whole math problem, right? A charge of our complex ion is going to equal the charge of the metal plus the total charge of the ligands. So our complex ion has a one plus charge, so that's gonna go there. And then we have cobalt plus um, four of our ammonias, which are zero charge, right? They don't have any charge, so that's gonna go away. And then we have two of our chlorides, which each have a negative one charge. So if we simplify this, we'll get plus one equals cobalt minus two. And then if we add two to both sides, we'll get that our cobalt is plus three, which again, if we went up here and reasoned that out, right, the ammonias don't have any charge. We have two chlorides, right, which would give us a two minus, but our overall charge is a positive. So that means that has to be a three plus to get that to be a positive. So we're all good to go there. All right. I want you to pause here and get some practice doing this because your life will be a lot easier if you feel really solid about getting the charge of the metal ion. So pause here, figure out the charge of the metal ion in each one of these coordination compounds. Once you're done, unpause, come back and see the answers. All right, let's go through this. So for the first one, we have sodium and we've got a, you know, a zinc complex ion. So we have two positively charged sodiums. So our total positive is a two plus, which means that our um, complex ion has to be a two minus. Okay, so that means that this is ZnOH4 two minus. Okay, and so we're gonna use that formula again. We've got two minus is equal to zinc plus four times negative one because each one of those hydroxides has a minus one charge. So if we go ahead and solve, then we'll get our zinc is a plus two. And just as a heads up, zinc is almost always a plus two. It's very, very rare you would ever see zinc as something else. Um, so zinc, that one's always a good bet. All right, um, here's another one. So if we look at this, we have potassium as our counter ion. So we have potassium as a one plus, which means that our poly, our uh, sorry, our, our complex ion is going to have a charge of one minus. So we'll go through the exact same thing. Um, we have a one minus charge, and then we've got our cobalt, um, two times our water. We know that water is neutral, so that's not gonna affect us there. And then two times a negative two. Um, this is oxalate here. Oxalate is a polyatomic that you should know, and that has a, a two minus charge, okay? Uh, and then we can go ahead and rearrange, and we'll get that cobalt is a three plus. On the last one, we have bromide, um, which is canceling out the charge of our complex ion. So bromide is a one minus, which means our complex ion has to be a one plus. Um, and we'll go through the exact same thing. So here's our one plus, and we have, you know, ruthenium plus two times zero for our water, and then two times zero for our ammonia, and then we have two times negative one for our chlorides. Um, so if we go through and we simplify it and solve, we'll get that ruthenium is a three plus. All right, now that we know how to name, or sorry, now that we know how to figure out our charge 
on our uh, metal, now we can go ahead and name these coordination compounds. Okay, so um, here we go. Lots of rules, just as a heads up, lots of rules. I actually made an entire separate document on how to name coordination compounds, and it has all of these rules. It has a bunch of the ligands and their names. It has a bunch of metals and their names when they're in anionic compounds, um, and it also has prefixes. So I would recommend checking that out, especially when you are working on naming. It may be really handy to have next to you while you're learning how to do this. Okay. Back to this, the cation named before the anion. That's the same, that's normal. Um, the name of an, any cation or anion that's not in the complex ion. So any of these simple, uh, you know, like the sodiums, the bromides, you're gonna name them just like any other ionic compound. So you're not gonna use any prefixes with them, right? Um, you're just gonna write, if it's sodium, you're just gonna write sodium. Even if there's three sodiums, just write sodium. Um, but you know, if it's an anion like bromine, you would change it to bromide. So within the complex ion, the ligands are named in alphabetical order before the metal ion, okay? Um, so we're going to write, you know, all of the ligands come first, and you have to make sure that you pay attention to, you know, alphabetize those ligands. Um, we are going to put prefixes um, on the ligands. You do not use the prefixes when you're alphabetizing. Well, hang on. You don't use the prefix as your basis for the alphabetizing. You're gonna use the root, like bromo or chloro, things like that, not dibromo, but bromo itself. Um, when we are um, looking at the names of the ligands, if you have an anionic ligand, you're gonna drop the ide and add O after the root name. So this is like if you had um, a chloride as, an, as a ligand. You would not call it chloride, you would call it chloro, or bromide would, would be bromo. That's what it's talking about there. Um, and a numerical prefix is used to indicate the number of ligands of a particular type. So um, let's say you had two bromos, right? Two bromides. Um, then you would put dibromo, okay? Or, you know, if you had three, you'd put tribromo, okay? Um, like I said, prefixes don't affect the alphabetical order of the ligand names. You're always going to look at the root, what the ligand actually is. Um, when we have prefixes, or sorry, when we have ligands that are monodentate, we're going to use our normal prefixes that you're used to. Di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, all of that. Okay, those are for monodentate ligands. So that would be things like water, ammonia, um, you know, those halogens, things like that. But if we have a polydentate ligand, so this would be, you know, our bidentate or any polydentate ligands, you're going to use bis, tris, or tetricus as um, the prefixes there. Okay, and this is often because, well, first off, it indicates that it is a polydentate ligand. It's not a monodentate ligand. And it also... Um, is used because, you know, think of something like um, ethylene diamine, right? Ethylene diamine already has a prefix in its name, right? Diamine. So we, use, we would say bis ethylene diamine to indicate that it's two of that entire thing. As you can see, this is going to be lots of fun. Um, so here you go. Um, ethylene diamine and ethylene diamine uh, tetraacetate, right, EDTA, have prefix prefixes in their names already. We are going to include parentheses around the names. So like if I was writing bis ethylene diamine, then I would put bis parentheses ethylene diamine and then go on. Um, and then we're going to use a Roman numeral to indicate the oxidation state for a metal that can have more than one state, which is going to be most of them in this particular chapter, right? Like if you think about iron, iron can be a two plus or it can be a three plus, right? Those are kind of common for iron. Um, so we'll include a Roman numeral after we say iron um, to indicate which oxidation state we're talking about. And then finally, if we have a complex ion that's an anion, and this is only if it's an anion, then we're going to drop the ending of the metal name and end with A-T-E. Like iron becomes ferrate, right? We're going to use instead of ferrous, it becomes ferrate. Um, so this is super fun. Uh, but we don't do this if the complex ion is a cation, then we would just call it iron and then we would put the number in parentheses. If it's part of the anion, then we would put ferrate and then put the number in parentheses. Either way, you're gonna put the number in parentheses, just the way that you name that metal is going to be slightly different. Um, your brain 
might be a little full right now. We're going to do some examples. And like I said, find that document. It has the rules on it and it has the names of all of these ligands and the metals and the prefixes. You're going to be glad that you found it. So here they are, like I said, um, with the ligands, right? If they end in IDE, um, then we are going to change it to end in O. So like bromide becomes bromo, um, chloride becomes chloro. Um, our neutral molecules have names, which are fun and don't necessarily follow that. Water, we call it aqua. Ammonia, we call it amine. This is not amine, this is amine. It's got two M's. Um, and then for carbon monoxide, we have carbonyl. And then ethylene diamine is just, it is what it is. Um, and then like I was saying, when we have our metal in an anionic um, complex, so a complex ion that is negatively charged, you do not do this for complex ions that are positively charged, just for the negative ones, okay? Um, so like chromium would now be chromate or, you know, copper would be cuprate. Okay, zinc would be zincate. Um, so if it's um, if it's a cation, right? If your if your uh, complex ion is a cation, then you're going to name it normally. Okay, you would write chromium or cobalt. Um, but if it's an anion, then you're going to change the name. All right, let's go through some examples. So here's our first one. Okay, um, we see that. Um, our, we have a cation as our complex ion, and we have, you know, these two chlorines, which are balancing the charge. So we know that it's going to end in, it's going to be like blah, 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 something, chloride. Okay, so now we just need to figure out what the something is that comes at the beginning, that complex ion. But it's going to end in chloride. So we look at our, um, our ligands. So we have water as one of our ligands, and we have chloride as the other. Okay, so if we thought about them as water and chloride, you might think that, you know, chloride comes first, but it doesn't because when we name water, we call it aqua. Okay, so we have aqua and we have chloro. So that means when we name this, the water is going to come first because we go in alphabetical order. Okay, all right. Now we need to figure out our charge on our metal. So we go through the process like we did before. So um, these two chlorides, right, they have a two minus charge. So that means our entire um, complex ion has a two plus charge to balance it out. We also have a negative charge in there from the chloride. Um, so that means that chromium has to be a three plus because it's got to balance out this one negative and then two more negatives. So we've got chromium as a three plus. Now we can go through and actually name it because we've got all the little pieces going on. Um, so when we name this complex ion, we're always going to name the ligands first. Remember alphabetical order. So we have um, five waters. So it's going to be penta aqua, and this is actually wrong. Penta aqua, and then chloro chromium three. Okay. Um, please note we usually don't use mono in these complex ions, um, we just use it if there's more than one. If you're writing it at all, we assume there's one there. So you don't need to say monochloro. So penta aqua chloro chromium three. Notice we didn't change the name of the chromium because our complex ion is a cation. You only change the name of your metal if the complex ion is an anion, okay? Um, and then all of that um, together, right, with, with the, um, the chlorides at the end, we would say penta aqua, chloro, chromium three, chloride, okay? And the only space here is going to be the space between the cation and the anion, okay? Let's try another one. So um, now we have our um, complex ion as our anion. So we have um, our potassium is coming first. So again, we're just gonna name that as potassium. It doesn't matter that there's three of them. Uh, it's just gonna be potassium. So it's gonna be potassium something. Um, and then we need to figure out how to name our complex ion. We only have one ligand here, so that's our cyanide, so this is cyano, okay? And then we need to figure out the charge on our iron, okay? This is a three plus from um, the potassium, and then we have six minus from the cyanides because each one of those is one minus. So we have three plus and six minus, that means iron must be a three plus to balance that whole thing out. Um, when we name this, we are going to name iron as ferrate because it is in an anion, okay? Our entire complex ion is an anion, so we have to change the name of our metal. So when we're looking at naming our complex ion, we have, again, remember ligands come first, hexacyano because there's six cyanides, and then ferrate three, okay? And so then if we put it together with potassium, it'd be potassium 
hexacyanoferrate 3. All right, I want you to try these out, okay? Really take some time. Don't just rush through it and press play so that you can move on with the lecture. Really try these out. Um, and if you're not understanding them, please send me a message. I have lots of practice problems um, on your chapter 25 lecture worksheet, but I wanna make sure that you're getting your questions answered you know, in this lecture if you can. So go through, try them, pause, do all that, and then come back when you're ready to see the answers. All right, let's see what we got. So first one, so we have um, sodiums and then our complex ion. So again, remember, we're just gonna name that first bit as sodium. It doesn't matter that there's three of them. It's just gonna be sodium something. Um, so then we need to go through and name our complex ion. So we have um, fluoride as our ligand. It's the only one. Um, so that's going to end up being fluoro or hexafluoro, right? Because there are six of them. And then we need to figure out the charge of the aluminum. So there are, you know, sodium is giving us a three plus here, and we've got a six minus from the fluorides. So to balance that all out and make this neutral, that means aluminum has to be a three plus. Now, aluminum is always a three plus. Um, so we don't need to include the Roman numerals after aluminum. Um, if you can I'm not going to mark you wrong in this particular class. It's just really going to be redundant. You should notice that aluminum is not a transition metal and therefore does not have multiple oxidation states. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have um, sodium, right? Hexafluoroaluminate. Remember that we need to change the name um, of aluminum because our complex ion is an anion, not a cation. All right, let's try the next one. So um, now we have our complex ion as our cation. So it's going to be something and then nitrate, okay? Um, nitrate is a one minus charge. Um, so that means our entire uh, complex ion is going to be a one plus, okay? We have two different ligands on this. We have ethylene diamine and we have chloride. Okay, remember, when we are naming these, we are always going to go alphabetically, so our chlorides are gonna come first. So it's gonna be dichloro, and then remember, um, ethylene diamine is polydentate, right? It's, it's bidentate. So we need to use our other uh, prefixes when we are naming ethylene diamine. So we're gonna use you know, the whole bis, tis, tr uh, bis, tris, tetricus. So here there's two, so that's gonna be bis, and then we put ethylene diamine in parentheses because it has a prefix in its name. So we need to show that this all stays together so that we can say, okay, there are two of this whole thing. So dichloro, bis, ethylene diamine, and then we need to figure out the charge on our cobalt. So um, there is um, ethylene diamine, sorry, um, ethylene diamine is neutral. So that is not affecting our, our charges at all, okay? Chlorides are gonna be a total of two minus, and then we have another one minus coming from the nitrate. And to balance that all out, that means that cobalt has to be a three plus. So then it's cobalt three. Remember, we don't change the name of the cobalt here because cobalt is in a cation, not in an anion. All right, so now go in the other way. So what is the formula of tetraamine bromo chloro platinate four chloride? What a mouthful. All right, so remember when we're writing these, um, the metal ion is always going to be written first in our um, complex ions, okay? Our complex ion here is our cation, so we need to deal with that first, and then we're gonna put chlorides at the end to balance out our complex ion. So we know it's gonna start with platinum, right? So what I like to do, I'm like, all right, this is the, this is the, um, the complex ion, it's gonna put a bracket, I'm gonna put a platinum, okay? Because I know that's what's going to happen. Uh, then we're gonna write the neutral ligands and then the negative ligands in uh, alphabetical order, okay? So we have our neutral ligand is our amine, right? Tetraamine. So we have NH3, four. And then we have two different anionic ligands. We have bromo and we have chloro, and we write them in alphabetical order because they are both negatively charged, right? We go neutral, then negatively charged, and then alphabetical order. So we've got one of the bromines and one of the chlorines. Okay, so we can go ahead and put that whole thing um, in brackets. 
So now we'll go and figure out the charge because we need to know how many of our chlorides to balance that whole thing out. So it told us that platinum is a four plus. So we have four plus, and then we have another, you know, a one minus here that gets us to three plus, and then we have a one minus that gets us to two plus. So we need two chlorides to balance this whole thing out. Okay. All right, let's try another one. So what is the formula of hexaamine cobalt three tetrachloroferrate three? So if you look, we have two different complex ions, right? We have a complex cation and we have a complex anion. So let's deal with the first one first. So we have hexaamine cobalt three. Okay, so again, I would always, you know, I'm like, I know it's gonna have a bracket and then we're gonna have cobalt and then hexaamine. That means we are going to have six um, ammonias. And then we get brackets. Okay, and then we have tetrachloroferrate three. And I'm gonna leave a little, just a smidgen of space, just in case I needed to put um, you know, a, a subscript to balance each other out, okay? But we have tetrachloroferrate three. So we put our ferrate, right, our iron, and then we have tetrachloro, so that's Cl4. And then I know that's gonna be in brackets, but now they don't necessarily automatically exactly cancel out. So I'm gonna figure out the charge on my first, um, my, my first complex ion, my complex cation. So we have hexaamine cobalt three. The amines, right, our ammonias are neutrally charged. They don't have any charge. So the entire charge on this whole thing is gonna be a three plus because it's only coming from the cobalt. If we look at tetrachloroferrate three, right, our iron is a three plus, but we have four chlorides that are balancing it out, right? So we have um, three plus and four negative, that means this overall is going to be a one minus charge. So in order for us to, you know, have a neutral compound, we are going to need three of these in order to balance out the charge of this guy. So we're going to put a three on the outside to balance the charge. Please note that that three on the outside does not show up in the name of our uh, coordination compound. Okay, that three is just to balance the charge. It's kind of like um, if we had named something like this, we named this aluminum oxide. We don't have any prefixes in the names. We just have those subscripts to balance out the charges. It's the same thing here. You can think about this as an ionic compound, same, same. Um, we're not gonna have any prefixes overall to tell us the names of, or the numbers of these subscripts um, here. We're just using them to balance out the charges. All right, our last topic for today is we're going to look a little bit at bonding and complex ions. We will get more into this uh, next time, but this is just um, kind of a brief introduction into bonding, okay? Um, we know, we've talked about this before, when a complex ion forms, our ligand is donating an electron pair to the metal ion. We've talked about this multiple times, right? Our ligand gives its electron pair to the metal. Um, the ligand is acting as a Lewis base. It's an electron donor. And that metal ion is acting as a Lewis acid. It is an electron acceptor, okay? And this type of bond, we call it a coordinate covalent bond because both of the shared electrons are coming from one atom in the pair. Whereas if you think back when we were doing um, covalent bonding, you know, way back in Chem 1, just normal covalent bonding, usually each atom is going to give up one electron, right? And they're gonna share, you know, each one will share one electron to make that covalent bond. A coordinate covalent bond is different because those two electrons are both coming from the same atom um, that's, you know, and being shared. So one atom gives no electrons and the other one gives two as opposed to each one sharing one. Okay, so today we are going to talk about valence bond theory. Okay, we have talked about valence bond theory before, back in chapter 10 of Chem 1. Um, and if you'll remember, that's when we were drawing those flower diagrams to show the overlap of the orbitals that are involved in bonding. Okay, um, and so, right, like I said, uh, in terms of valence bond theory, we have filled orbital of the ligand is going to overlap with an empty orbital of the metal ion. Okay, um, and so when I say a filled orbital, I mean an orbital where there are electrons, right? That ligand has a filled orbital. It has two electrons um, in a lone pair, right? That is a filled orbital. Um, and so it is going to overlap with a completely empty orbital of the metal ion. And again, this is going to be different from the flower diagrams um, that we did when we were first learning how to do valence bond theory with you know, normal covalent bonding because there each 
atom would donate one electron in order to form this bond. Here, we're having a completely filled orbital of our ligand overlapping with an empty orbital of our metal ion. Um, so this valence bond theory is good. Um, it proposes that the geometry of the complex ion depends on the hybridization of the metal ion. So if the metal ion is sp, it'll give linear. Um, if it's, you know, sp3, then it may be tetrahedral, right? And so um, these geometries of our complex ions are from the hybridization of the metal. And so it explains geometries really well, uh, but it doesn't explain all of these cool colors that we see, and it doesn't explain the magnetic properties. And these are really big issues because as you, like, as you can visually see, right, color is a big part of, you know, of these complex ions and of coordination chemistry and magnetic properties are really specific to these transition metals and to these complex ions. Um, so this is a really big issue. So we're going to use valence bond theory to talk about geometry, but we're going to use crystal field theory, which we'll talk about last next time, um, to look at color and magnetic properties. Okay, so like I said, um, the hybridization of our metal is going to determine our geometry. Okay, so if we have sp hybridized, we'll have linear. If it's sp3, we'll have tetrahedral. dsp2 is going to be square planar, and then octahedral will be d2 sp3. These are the only four we're going to look at in this class, uh, just because they are the most common hybridization schemes for these complex ions. Okay, so it it matters um, what the hybridization of the metal is, but it also depends on the coordination number. Um, of the metal, right? How many ligands are bonded to it? So when we have a coordination number of two, that means we're going to have a linear shape. If we have um, a coordination number of four, we can either have a square planar shape or we can have a tetrahedral shape. Because um, if you look, square planar is going to be dsp2, tetrahedral is going to be sp3. But either way, if you add these up, like one plus three, right, or one plus one plus two, we're getting four either way. So both of those will be from four ligands. Um, the different shapes are from the different orbitals that are involved in the bonding, okay, the different overlaps of the orbitals. And then if we have six as our coordination number, right, we have six ligands on our metal, then we will have an octahedral shape. All right, just a little bit of looking at how this might happen. So um, if we have something that is tetrahedral, right? So here we have zinc, and it's being bonded to four different hydroxides. Okay, so zinc is going to be a 2+, plus, um, and that's because it's lost those 4s electrons, so you're seeing this empty 4s orbital. Um, and when we are forming this complex ion, we hybridize these empty orbitals. So again, this is different from when we looked at this in Chem 1 because we were often hybridizing orbitals that already had electrons in them and maybe involving some d orbitals as well, but we often had orbitals with electrons in them. Here, these orbitals have no electrons because all eight of these electrons that are going to show up are completely from the hydroxides. Remember, this is different. These coordinate um, covalent bonds are different because all of the electrons are coming from the ligand. So each one of those four hydroxides is going to donate two electrons. Um, so it's going to fill up all four of these orbitals. So this will be sp3, and this will give us a tetrahedral shape. If we hybridize um, a d, the s, and two p orbitals like we have in this nickel complex, then we can get a square planar shape. Um, but again, right, we're going to hybridize only empty orbitals. This orbital that we wanted to use to hybridize wasn't empty yet. So what happens is one of those electrons moves over um, so that that, you know, that orbital can be empty and again can be filled from all, with all of the electrons from the cyanide. And then finally, if we hybridize six orbitals, so two d orbitals, an s, and three p, um, because we have six ligands, right, so we need 12 electrons, um, if we hybridize all of those, then we can get an octahedral shape, okay? So again, this follows a lot of the same um, rules that we looked at when we were doing chapter 10. The difference here is that when we form these overlap of the orbitals, there are filled orbitals from our ligands and completely empty orbitals from our metals, 
And that is it for today. We've covered a lot of ground. We looked at applications of these coordination compounds and complex ions out in, you know, the real world, um, especially with some biological applications. We've looked at how to name coordination compounds and how to write the formulas. Uh, those are going to take some work, guys. So um, you have problems in your chapter 25 lecture worksheet, and you have lots of problems to practice on Alex, which I know you're really excited about, um, but you need to get really good at naming those. And then finally, we started talking a little bit about how the geometries of these coordination compounds and complex ions um, can be predicted by valence bond theory. But like I said, it doesn't predict color very well, and it doesn't predict the magnetic properties very well. Um, so next time we are going to look at crystal field theory so that we can explain some of these properties a little bit better. Um, I know it was a lot, um, but keep working hard. You guys are doing great. Check out that chapter 25 lecture worksheet to get more practice on this stuff. And as always, if you have any questions, please send them my way. I am more than happy to help you out. Otherwise, keep working hard, and I will talk to you guys next time.